Great. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Um, we're a webinar. Some people don't like that word, but that's what people are calling these. Uh, webinar, webcast, online show, um, whatever you um, choose to describe these kind of things as. We are um, live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We do record our shows every week and post them on our website later. And I'll show you that at the end of today's show where you can see um, all of our previous recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, or for your colleagues, friends, neighbors, family, anyone who might be interested in any of the topics we have. They're welcome to join us um, on our live shows on Wednesdays or um, to go on and watch all of our recordings. We um, post all of our show recordings to our YouTube account, the Library Commission's YouTube account, so you can watch them there. If there are presentations, websites that are mentioned, um, we also include those as well. The, this, um, this slideshow will be available to you to watch afterwards and any websites that might be mentioned during it I will capture and put into the Library Commission's Delicious account so that you can um, have access to them all in one place as well. Uh, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, presentations, uh, demos, book, book reviews, sometimes many training sessions, basically anything library related we um, have on the show. That's really our only criteria is it's something to do with libraries, something that libraries are actually doing, something that might be a good resource for libraries, something of interest to them, um, we have them on the show. We do sometimes bring in guest speakers onto the show, um, but we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations and um, for us. And that's what we have this morning. Um, on the show with us today is Craig Lefteroff. He is the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Hi, Craig. Hello. Hello. And normally you would, when we're doing something like this with someone from our, um, if you've watched the show before from the commission, we'd have a little camera view of us, but we are not together this morning. <laughs> I'm at home. Um, we had some icy roads here today and some of us weren't able to get into the office. So I'm at home and Craig's at the office. So we're just going to have his slides up. No camera view for this one today. Sorry. <laughs> um, so um, this is a session that Craig did. Um, we had a youth was a youth services retreat that was last fall. Last yes. summer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nebraska. Um, and I thought it was very interesting. I did not attend the retreat myself, unfortunately, but I thought it was a really cool topic here about the virtual reality and youth. So um, I asked Craig to come on Encompass Live and share it with us. So I'll just uh, hand over to you then, Craig, to take it away. All righty. OK, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, All right, looks like we're good to go. So, is, all set, Krista? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Good. All right. Um, well, basically, I remember hearing about virtual reality when I was a teen. It was hype back then, many decades ago, but it's really starting to kind of come together, and the promise of the technology is starting to come to fruition uh, in an accessible way. So. For today, we'll be talking a bit about what it is. Virtual reality as a term is a big umbrella that covers a lot of different um, iterations. So we'll get into all that. We'll talk about some of the apps that are available, especially apps that might be useful in a library. We'll get into hardware and some of the platforms that are emerging. And lastly, we'll talk about problems and some workarounds to those problems. So there are really two or three approaches, depending on who you ask about virtual reality. Um, one is virtual reality itself, which is a classic thing affixed to your face, uh, immersive, you only see the digital world version of virtual reality. And you don't see the real world in this case. You're seeing uh, computer generated animation, you're interacting with this imaginary environment. So this is the most immersive approach to VR. Um, it's not totally immersive because it's only capturing your sight. You still have to have headphones to hear things. You still have to have one of these very bulky gadgets to feel things through haptic sensors and whatnot. Um, so it's not totally immersive, but it's definitely the most immersive form of VR available. To me, the big tell with this version of VR is the headsets. That's kind of the, the classic attribute of this approach. 
Moving on from there, augmented reality is another a way to kind of approach VR. In this case, you do see the real world, so you're seeing what's in front of you, and that can be conveyed through a headset, but it can also be conveyed through a tablet or a phone. Um, digital objects are integrated into that visual scene, so you're seeing the painting that's in front of you, but you're also seeing pop-ups to give you extra information about the painting, maybe videos, maybe um, a website of some sort. And as I said, this is smartphones and tablets and devices, so it's not just the headset, and that sort of um, might indicate why this is a very popular approach at the moment. The third approach is rather controversial or vague. It's called mixed reality. Some people say this doesn't even exist. They say this is just kind of an offshoot version of AR. It works essentially the same way. Objects are integrated into a real scene, so it's using the camera in your phone or your tablet to pick up what's in front of you and then adding a cartoon bear or you know blocks that move around your screen. The difference with mixed reality is that these objects that are imaginary have some sort of dimension. They have some physicality, so they're anchored in place or they interact with real objects in a way that feels convincing. You don't have a little cartoon guy jumping all around the screen. That cartoon guy is anchored, so it's almost like you're interacting with something that's real. Uh, that would be like the, the your Pokemon Go, too, correct? Correct. The mixed reality? Right, yeah. So it uh, although it's originally as the augmented, I know that, but you're right, it's more, it's a mixture, yeah. Yeah, they've gotten better at Pokemon Go as far as fixing things in place. I've seen video where, you know, you have these little creatures that are moving all over the place and they're jittering all over the screen, but it's definitely got a lot more in line with mixed reality at this point. Um, I wanted to start by talking about AR because it kind of is the most prevalent right now and the first iteration of AR that really took hold with the public at large was a game called Ingress, uh, played on a smartphone so there's an app that you could install and you would join one of two factions and basically it kind of sent you all around the city to interact with uh, these digital objects and other players and complete these challenges. And that might sound similar to what Krista just mentioned, Pokemon Go, because it was used to build Pokemon Go. Um, sort of works the same way. Uh, for those of you who recall about six months ago, Pokemon Go was hot news. Everybody was talking about it. When I walked around you know, outside for lunch, I would see people looking at their phones, walking around the block. Uh, it just seemed like it was really universal. It has tapered off quite a bit, but it's definitely still one of the more popular iterations of AR. They actually lost um, a quite a large amount of users in August of last year, and it's faded a bit more since then, but I'd say it's still one of the more popular um, AR apps out there. The other app that is relatively popular that could be considered AR is Snapchat. Um, you guys have probably seen the images with the cartoon editions of the, you know, the dog nose and the cute ears and whatnot. Um, that has sort of developed via Snapchat's new world lenses feature into more of a, a real AR sort of thing. So it's not just a fixed image, but it's something like this. This very lovely gif of, uh, you know, rainbows coming out of the clouds. So those are the two that you probably heard about already, but I I think there are apps that might be useful for librarians, and one of the big ones is Erasma. This is an app that basically you download onto your phone. It uses your phone's camera to pick up objects in real life. So if you have a bookshelf, if you have a display, if you have a painting on your wall, you can set that as a trigger in Erasma and then tell the app to give you some sort of um, action inside the app itself. So you can get video, you can get images or text. And it's probably easiest for you guys to see this rather than me just telling you. So I made this video using a screen recorder on my phone, which is why it's kind of small and not taking up the entire screen. But I'll just play this for you. Um, I do want to warn you, there's one part where it gets a little loud, so you might want to keep your mouse near the volume control on your computer but I will let you know before that happens in the video. Uh, 
Uh, Craig, if you're using your headset for your audio, then it's not hearing the sound from the, the video you're doing. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, let me... Let me see if I can fix that. Yeah, it doesn't catch the sound and carry it through on that. You'd have to have, like, using your external speakers and your microphone up to them to get the audio second. part sorry, coming guys. through. That's okay. But we can see the video working. That was... Are you able to hear that? No, yeah, video through GoToWebinar can be kind of fickle. <laughs> okay, let me try one other alternative before we give Wait, it up. What here. I do is kind of old school where I just hold my microphone, when I have like a separate desktop microphone, up to my speakers so that it can capture the audio. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. So give me a second just to bring my speaker over. That's the dot in the center with the other dots. There we go. Now we can hear it. Yep. Okay. So let me restart it. It's a little and low, but you can hear it, yeah. On the screen is the Erasma app. That's, That's the dot in the center with the other dots kind of being recalled away from it. Um, it indicates Erasma is running. We'll also use this to center on objects that you kind of identified as triggers, which I will show you right now. Actually, this is something created by a library using Erasmus, so we'll just point at the computer screen. Hey, Herod, the title of my book is Three Nights in Ham. I recommend this book for laughs and rhymes. <laughs> the theme of this book is to not judge something before you try it. In this book, Sam is convincing the other character to eat Three Nights in Ham. My favorite character is Sam because he's convincing. To summarize, Green Eggs and Ham is a book for all ages, has two main characters, and it teaches you not to judge something before you try it. Danny Horizon, the title of my... And it just loops if you stay on there. Here is another example that's a little loud, so you might want to turn down your volume just a touch before I move onto it. know how many library materials you can check out? Three. Yeah, three. Well, you could check out one DVD and two just write books, or play away and two just write books, or you could just check out three just write books. Anyway, make sure to bring them back. Do you know how... And as you can tell, the orientation of the auras as they're being created is kind of important. The first one was kind of sideways, um, and there's not much you, could, you can do about that as an end user. So when you're creating this stuff, you do want to keep orientation, whether landscape or otherwise in mind. Um, you can use Erasma for objects that are in real life as well, not just objects on a screen. This is an example of a uh, bookmark uh, for our Nebraska libraries on the web service. So I will just point at it, and hopefully this works. It gives me a pop-up of the main page of Nebraska libraries on the web, and if I tap it, it takes me out to your asthma browser. And once it loads up, you'll see it because it's the main screen of the Nebraska Libraries on the website. So if someone had their phone, they could just point right at a bookmark with minimal information and be redirected to the website that has all the information you'd ever want. We'll go back to our asthma. And one more example of a 3D object. This is a Google Cardboard viewer. It's a actually literally a cardboard case. So we'll just point at it. Sometimes it doesn't work well with objects that aren't completely rectangular. This one has some curves, but we did get our pop-up and tap here for instruction. When I tap it, it sends me out to YouTube. <laughs> certainly create your own video, upload it to Erasma just as an MP4, and set it to trigger whenever an object is detected by the app. Wow. Moving around a bit, I have a painting on my wall, and I've 
uh, created a trigger using the painting. So if I just move up here, you'll see we get a nice overlay of additional artwork. If we move closer, we can get a bit more detail. This isn't the greatest image in terms of resolution, so it's a little iffy. But it kind of demonstrates what you can do. I actually just moved around my desk. So it's visible and kind of legible no matter where you are. And those are some examples of how to use Erasma. It's very easy to set this stuff up. You can do it in less than five minutes. So I would recommend implementing it in your library if you think it might be useful. OK, and I'm going to ditch the headphones and stick with speakers, if that's OK. Sure, sounds good. Um, so that, that Eras that's not QR codes, is it? It's something completely different. It's similar right, to yeah. like when you would use a QR code and bring it to a website, but. Yeah, it's actually picking up the dimensions of a particular object in your camera view. So it's not necessarily scanning the code, but it works pretty much the same way. That was pretty slick. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Right. The thing I like about Erasma is that libraries are already using it, so there's a lot out there in terms of ideas and things that they're doing. And these are really two examples. There's a library that um, created an aura with one of their signs from a shelf. So instead of just having the sign that says 200 to 299 religion, you can make it an aura that gives additional information or even says something like, you know, Ms. Smith's class go here for your books for your report and the Beyonce thing is from a display so you can use the Orasma to send people onto the catalog if they wanted to pull up CDs by Beyonce or maybe even you know biographical articles in a database you can easily forward them that way. Um, this is another example and I think it's really cool it's a scavenger hunt that Cedar Rapids created using Erasma so they have people you know, walk through the library with their phone with Erasma enabled and they just point at stuff until they find an aura. And it just seemed like a really neat way to get them walking around the library to see things as opposed to the traditional kind of guided tour of the building. Um, there are a few other apps and they all work pretty similarly. There is Blipper, which is almost identical to Erasma. You point at something, you get some kind of reaction. Um, most of these apps do include AR in their name, so you know they're augmented reality, so you'll notice that as we go along. Blipper tends to focus more on commercial stuff like cereal boxes, and they've done some stuff with Coke. But I mention them here because they own kind of a sub-company called Layer, and Layer has actually worked with libraries in the past. They worked with a group of libraries in Europe on a report that they had issued, basically just talking about ways that libraries had affected a community. Um, and Layer actually worked with them to generate these events, which were essentially people giving testimonials about how the library had improved their life. So rather than just reading stats, you were able to see a real person talk about what the library had done and which services they enjoyed. There are a few apps that are specifically directed at libraries, although I'll tell you in advance this is going to be rather disappointing if you're into some of these ideas. One is Library. Again, you see the AR incorporated into the name. And this was basically announced a few years ago. It's an app that would do a number of different things inside a library. You could search the catalog inside the app. You could use the camera in your device to locate items or to see at a glance what's on a particular shelf. Um, there's a video on YouTube that gives a demonstration of it and these are some screenshots. So essentially when a person approaches the book they would get this digital trigger of this is the location, this is the marker where the book is. When they pointed a shelf they would get a list of categories for what's on that shelf. So clearly you could see this would be very helpful for library users. Um, the problem is that there hasn't been really any activity on this project for a few years. So there's really not a lot of explanation about how it works. You know, does it use RFID? Is it an Orasmus sort of thing where it's picking up an object and that's causing something to happen in the app? 
And the other issue with finding information about it is The Legend of Zelda, because there's apparently a character called Library that's spelled the same way. So if you try to search for it, you'll find a lot of Zelda stuff, but not a lot of information about this app. Another app that would be very useful for us would be Shelvar. Um, and this basically is a shelf reading app. So you affix these tags to a book and just point your phone at a shelf and it tells you whether something is out of place. Um, it would be very useful. I've done some shelf reading and this would save a lot of time. Unfortunately, um, the people who are working on the project have kind of shut down operations because Amazon has a patent pending on the same idea. So those are two things that would be helpful for us but aren't going to be available probably soon. Um, although the fact that they're out there and the ideas are present is kind of encouraging. I suppose we might see this stuff at some point. In terms of apps that are available that are successful and being used by the public, um, Los Angeles Public Library has an app called Archive LAPL, and this really isn't focused on their collection of materials. This is more focused on items in the building itself. Apparently they have a lot of paintings, a lot of decor. So if someone downloads this app onto their phone, uses it essentially the same way as Erasma, just points at an object and it gives additional details and background on that object. There's also Augment AR, which again works pretty much the same way. You're seeing the real world with digital objects and activities um, layered on top of it. With Augment, the catch or the, you know, the big hook is that you can integrate 3D CAD items into your display. So if you have someone who's working on a 3D printer model or some other CAD file, you can easily export that into the Augment display. If you're interested in creating your own AR app, there's a free program called AR Toolkit. Um, it's free, open source, and it allows you to build stuff from scratch. There's also a tool called Wikitude, which is not free. It's um, a sale product, but it's more or less focused on gaming. You can download a trial version that includes a watermark if you wanted to give it a shot before you know, spending any money on the final product. So that's it for AR. Uh, were there any questions about augmented reality so far? Uh, doesn't look like anything came in. Do any of you guys have any questions about the augmented reality part? It does look like, it, as you're saying, Craig, there's a lot of good things out there being developed for specifically for libraries, which is nice. Yeah, it's great. I guess we should keep an eye on if Amazon's going to use that patent to do something because that shelving one sounds like perfect, but yeah. <laughs> I know. I was so sad when I saw that it had you know, stopped production. It seems like such a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. but... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, the next – oh, I'm sorry. Nope. Go ahead. We're all good. <laughs> Um, the next kind of iteration that I wanted to discuss is mixed or merged reality. And the best example that I could find of this in terms of a finished app is an app called Help Lightning. This is sort of complicated, but let's say you have two people in two different locations and each one has a cell phone. The person at the first location is working in front of some board or you know, series of dials. So that person uses their phone to take a, an image of the dials or the board sends that on to person number two. Person number two sees the image on their phone, holds their hand in front of their phone, and then their hand is kind of brought into the image so they can point at dials, as you see right here, and identify what to touch and what not to touch and so on. So this is how it looks from the person number two side. You're basically just getting that entire image off of your screen and then pointing uh, in front of your phone's camera at a white background and it brings your hand into the image itself. And again, I think that's probably easier to visualize, so if you guys don't mind, I'll just show you another video and do the sort of speaker to the microphone thing. This is pretty short, but it does give you an indication of how this particular app works.
Help desk, how can I help you? It looks like the lights are turning on, but the motor is not working. Nothing's happening here. So, um, is there something you think you can help me with? Definitely. Let me go ahead and switch on our merge reality mode, and I'm going to take a look at what you're seeing. Okay. To test this, we might have to open it up. Let's go ahead and just remove the battery, clip in the sides, and then pull it directly out. Okay. Cool. Battery awesome. is removed. Now I'm already noticing one pin right there. Do you mind turning the Dremel towards me a little bit? Sure. I'm gonna go ahead and freeze the screen so you can see what I, I'm what I'm talking about. There's a metal pin right here that needs to be removed directly outward. So just go ahead and get a screwdriver and you can wedge that out like that. Uh, and this metal pin up here needs to be removed one side at a time. So simply just click it, pull it outward, and do the same thing with the other side once you're done with the first. And after it releases, you can pull it up over the Dremel, and then do the same thing with the other side and just pull it out. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm noticing that you've got five screws to remove. you got one, two, three, four, and five. These are going to need uh, bits, and it's going to look something like this, like a little bit of a star shape. Do you have anything that looks like this in your toolbox? Is this what you're talking about right here? Yep, exactly. So you can go ahead and start removing the screws. All right, perfect. You can simply just pull it apart. So grab onto one side, and you see where that line meets? Just mm -hmm. pull it directly apart. Simply pull out one side. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and get a close-up of the inside. Well, looking at the motor, there's one obvious problem right here. Look up at the top, you can see that this brass uh, coupling is actually disconnected. So, get a set of pliers and reconnect it back to the um, metal prong. There we go. Let me take another look real quick, make sure it's firmly on there. Yeah, that looks good. Now, now we're going to go ahead and test it before we completely reassemble it. So let's start by just putting on the other back. Just simply clip them together. That is pretty cool there. That mm -hmm. very futuristic. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I don't and want to show you the entire yeah. video. You get the idea. Um, I don't know if any libraries would necessarily be worried about you know fixing drills and things like that. But something like this could be useful in terms of programming or if your library has a small maker space, but you don't have a person in residence who's really an expert, um, it might be useful to use something like this to bring them in remotely and you know, kind of have a, an actual hands-on demonstration of how to do this stuff. Um, mixed and merged reality is probably going to be a bigger deal as time goes on. Intel is really putting a lot of effort into this whole concept. These are screenshots from one of their um, trade shows, essentially, and they're, you can see that hands, human hands are being brought into this digital world. Not perfectly, there's some you know, loss of image quality there and some shadowing, but it'll get better. And essentially, they are banking on this, um, this device called Project Alloy to be a big deal for them in the future. One way it differentiates from other headsets is that it's wireless. That's why the guy has the large um, area in the back, and that's actually a, a giant battery. So it doesn't have to be connected to anything. It's wireless. If you're doing AR, VR, or MR, um, being wireless is going to be a big benefit. You can move around without worrying about tripping over things or disconnecting and so on. Um, at this point, this is still kind of in the developmental phase. So no one really knows if the headset is going to look like this as a finished product. The um, developer version is allegedly going to be out later this year, but the public version is, you know, it, it's still up in the air when that's going to be released and available. So maybe coming soon, soonish. Something that is available right now is Microsoft's HoloLens, and this is merely three thousand dollars for a developer's model. Um, it runs on Windows Holographic Platform, so that's 
something they're going to be using in multiple devices going forward if this is successful. And it's again a kind of augmented reality or merged reality, mixed reality device. So you're seeing the real world, but you're also getting these digital overlays and are interacting with these animations. Sort of looks like this. Here's another screenshot that gives you a indication of how it uh, works. And as with the Intel, it's got cameras here in the headset, so it's picking up your hand movements, and that's causing uh, causing you to do things, you know, in this digital world. As far as models that are available right now, there's sort of the big three at the moment. Um, one is Oculus Rift. This is around $600, and this is how it looks. Obviously, if you're using it, you know, both your eyes, it's, uh, the image is integrated, but you get a feel for uh, image quality from the screenshot here. There's also the HTC Vive, and as you can see, this is dotted with cameras. You have cameras all over the place here. Uh, this is around $800. The big selling point for the HTC for some people is that it's allegedly less likely to cause motion sickness because those cameras are picking up the dimensions of your room and matching that to what you're seeing on the screen. So you're less likely to get the disconnect between your own motion and the motion that's happening digitally um, with HTC. There's also the PlayStation VR, which is, I think, the newest iteration of um, a platform, and that's around $450 to $500, so it's a bit cheaper than the others. However, you do need to have a PlayStation gaming console to use this. You also need a PlayStation camera and probably the motion controller, so all told, it's not that cheap compared to the other models. Um, if you're interested in viewing these, Oculus has a website at live.oculus.com that lists all of their in-store demos. HTC has one as well on Microsoft's site. And PlayStation, I believe, is doing uh, demos at Best Buy and GameStop stores. So you can actually go out and see how this stuff works before you invest money in it. The PlayStation one, that would be a PlayStation 4, I assume, the newest one you'd have to have. The, uh... Right, exactly, the PS4. Yeah. We do have a question. <laughs> uh, someone wants to know, is this similar to the technology that Tony Stark's Iron Man uses? Um, well, there's no repulsor ray that's available right now yet, but we're hoping it'll show up in the future. Yeah, because he has the, the displays that come up in his helmet or that he just brings up in front of him with his hands that he can manipulate. Right, the Jarvis program. Yeah. Um, it's not that advanced, probably, <laughs> but it's sort of similar, I guess. Yeah. It's the beginnings of that. We need a millionaire right. to, or billionaire to really invest in it, and then we're good to go. <laughs> yeah, 10 years or so, we should be there. Um, so if you're interested in any of these and you're mostly worried about content or games, you know that's going to be con a concern of how much can we get for this thing. If we just have a device and it doesn't have any games, it won't be very useful. For the most part, games aren't going to be exclusive to a platform, so this is an example of a game that I think is just hilarious. It's called Job Simulator, and it liter it's literally just a VR game that puts you in an office. So you eat donuts and you drink coffee, you make copies, and, and this is the future. Um, it's available for PlayStation VR. It's also available for the HTC platform. So uh, anything in terms of major games will appear on multiple platforms. This is another example of a game, Fantastic Contraption. It allows you to create these very elaborate models in VR. Um, for something like this, you probably want to make sure that your headset is really adept at picking up your hand motions. That's essentially all you're doing here. So uh, for something like that, you just want to make sure that the cameras are running well and there's no lag, but otherwise, in terms of games being exclusive or anything like that, I don't think it would be much of a consideration. So everything we've talked about so far in terms of devices has been hundreds or thousands of dollars, and now we're going to the opposite end of the spectrum. 
with Google Cardboard, which is literally made from cardboard. Um, you can buy a set for less than $20, or you can make your own set with the specs on Google's site. So if you have any boxes left from the holidays or pizza boxes, you can make your own Google Cardboard viewer. Uh, it's very cheap. The other appealing thing about it is that they already have a lot of pretty decent apps available. Um, some of these are device specific, so they're tied to a particular type of phone. But you do have a lot of things that are just open to any phone. They should work with any Google Cardboard viewer. Google's also affiliated, of course, with YouTube, so you get a lot of content there as well. Not just the stuff that Google is pushing out, but 360 videos from various users. So you'll always have a lot to see with this uh, Google Cardboard, even though it's relatively cheap in comparison to the other models. There are a few different viewers out for Google Cardboard, and this is probably, it's one of the ones that's been touted as the best. It's a Viewmaster, which has been rebooted as a VR company, not the company with the little disc that we all remember from childhood. Um, this is around $30 to $40. It can accommodate almost any device, so any size of phone, a phablet, a smaller phone, anything should fit in here, and um, you can use the customized guides to kind of wedge it in. It has multiple headphone jacks, and this is sort of important for me. I don't have 20-20 vision, so it has the focus style to allow you to kind of zoom in on them. <clears throat> excuse me. VR is not really that friendly to people who have glasses or have bad vision, so this is sort of a way to accommodate for that. That, I have to say, is a perfect rebranding of a company. Way to go. <laughs> we had those when I was a kid, yeah, yeah and just, yeah. And they were still cool, but this, I need to look into that myself. <laughs> um, Google is actually putting a lot into their VR sort of arm. Um, they have been touting this program called Daydream for about a year to two years. And they said it was coming last year, and it, indeed it did come last year. It's the Daydream View viewer, which is around $80. It works the same way as Google Cardboard, so you guys see the little... A compartment here that has a clasp. You would put your phone in here and then look through the other side. And um, again, it has quite a lot in terms of apps that are available. You get all these different apps and you have access to YouTube 360 as well. It does only work with certain phones at this point, so I think there are two that are operational. One's the Google Pixel and the Moto Z but they do say that they will expand this to other platforms soon, so the other three that I have listed there should be coming probably this year. And one last Google thing before we move on. Um, this is Google's Project Tango, which is similar. Uh, you're using your phone to take an image of your surroundings and then it automatically provides measurements and dimensions you can integrate uh, digital objects into your real images, so the dominoes that you see there. And they're also working with museums right now to kind of augment their displays and give people the opportunity to point a phone at a T-Rex skeleton and get tons of information about dinosaurs. These are some screenshots, so you can see that the phone is scanning the surroundings and getting um, kind of all this you know, dimensions and and whatnot. This is another example that's actually a digital tape measure, so that's been overlaid onto the computer image. And that's an example of the animated objects being integrated into a real image, so a game that is entirely digital is set onto this real table, and you get all these sort of dials and uh, tracking of speed and whatnot, so pretty cool. Again, at this point, they have two phones that are operational with this, Lenovo's Fablet phone, Giant phone, and Asus's Zenfone AR, which is apparently uh, specifically designed for augmented reality. So uh, if you don't have one of those two phones, you'll have to wait a bit to see this in action, but it's probably coming soon. The last thing that I wanted to mention in terms of platform or in terms of an app is Magic Leap which has been hyped for quite a few years, um, and very few people have seen this. Some journalists have seen this and have pretty much universally given it rave reviews, but there aren't a lot of details about how it might work. 
Um, they have released some images and some GIFs to get people hyped up about it, and this is one. Let's see if we can start that over. Wow. So it's allegedly going to look like this, and we're not sure if it's a headset or if it's, you know, something used via a device or, or what might happen. Um, again, coming soon, maybe. There was talk last week that Magic Leap is working on developing AR to help people with color blindness. So it's some sort of app that would help the color blind to differentiate color. Um, but again, not a lot of details about that, just some sort of speculation and rumor at this point. Okay, so potential problems. You guys, if you've done any VR, AR, MR, you're probably aware that sometimes it can make you feel a little squeamish or queasy uh, because of these health issues and you know the disconnect between movement on your screen and your body's movement. If you're sitting in a chair but you're seeing uh, mountains race by you as you're skiing down a hill, obviously you know that's two different sensations and your body really doesn't know how to deal with that. It can cause motion sickness. So there are a few things you can do to alleviate that sort of issue. One is actually to chew gum, or in some cases, uh, it's recommended to chew ginger because that apparently stabilizes you and helps your body um, get over this whole disconnect between what you're seeing and what you're feeling. The other is to keep a fan blowing on your face to simulate motion. A lot of people recommend doing that. And then the third is just to um, you know, take some time between your VR sessions and to limit what you're doing in terms of VR. The last thing that I wanted to discuss and to kind of leave you on this note is the Gartner hype cycle, which is a life cycle for technology. And they posit that whenever new technology is introduced, Produced. It's always hyped to the heavens as this world-changing thing, and then people actually get to use it and play with it and realize that, you know, it won't solve all my problems or it won't meet these promises that have been sort of inflated. So they have this um, series of kind of sections through which all technology proceeds. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in July of 2016, augmented reality was still in the trough of disillusionment but virtual reality had moved to the slope of enlightenment. So people are sort of getting a more realistic handle on what it can do and how they can use it. Um, it's probably a good time if you buy this whole chart to start implementing this technology and, you know, into libraries, into our real work. So people are sort of used to the idea of this is what we can do. It won't necessarily be the, the Tony Stark level stuff, but it can be useful. And I think we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, were there any questions or any comments? Have you guys used VR or using Google Cardboard or anything like that in your work? Good question, yeah. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions, um, comments, or anything? Um, or want to see anything else, anything that he had sh that Craig's shown? Um, yeah, that last one with the, uh, the whale or whatever jumping out of the floor. Yeah, I went to that website to to link it in, it did, that's pretty impressive when it, because it just automatically comes up on that page for that one. Yeah, that's yeah. really, a, if it works that way, it's going to be kind of a blow away mm -hmm. event. Now, that Magic Leap, that's not connected to that leap, the, the thing for the kids, the leap? No, it's a separate company. Okay. Uh, Magic Leap is running in Florida, and okay. they're kind of secretive about what they're doing. You kind of get news that trickles out occasionally about their products, but they're not affiliated with the, the leak pad or anything like that. Okay. So anybody have any questions, type them into your GoToWebinar questions interface. Um, are driven by iPad. Okay, someone does have a question here, Andrew. Uh, any recommendations? I'm looking at using Merge VR driven by iPod Touch. You mean in terms of apps to use or... Um, what are you looking for, Andrew? Uh, what gear to use, potentially low cost? Um, hmm. Well, the, the Vive has really been championed as 
a useful tool because of the multiple cameras in the headset and the whole issue of alleviating motion sickness. So that might be something to consider. Um, I say Merge VR is a, a virtual reality handset. It, headset says here another one for iPhone and Android. They look kind of pricey though. Yeah, sixty seventy dollars. I haven't actually heard of that. I don't know. Hmm. I just googled it. <laughs> oh, okay. Merge VR. Yeah, I'll put it on our link. Sixty dollars, huh? Hmm. But I suppose any of the things you've mentioned here was something to look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd really recommend checking out the in-store demos if you're interested. That will give you a feel for how they work and how comfortable they are. Um, and most of the companies do have websites that list the in-store demos. They even allow you to schedule a session with someone at you know Best Buy or GameStop or whatever store is hosting them. Yeah, every time I walk into Best Buy, there's somebody playing with the it's the, the PlayStation one there they have set up. Mm-hmm. But that the Viewmaster one, that one's can use anything, right? Yeah, that's um, Android or iPhone or yeah, okay. I guess BlackBerry still hanging around, maybe mm -hmm. uh, BlackBerry as well. So yeah, any phone allegedly can fit into here. It does have little clamps that you can manipulate to make sure it's snug and won't you know move around. And for cost, and, that one's pretty cheap because I just um um. I put it on my wish my Amazon wish list. <laughs> it's like seventeen dollars for it. But then there's also extra games and things you can get. Um, have you actually tried any of these? Andrew wants to know: Have you tried the ViewMaster headset or? I have not. I have the Google Cardboard I set. Thought you had so, the desk there, yeah. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to use the ViewMaster, but people that I know that have used it have said it's a better experience than the cardboard uh, because it's you know it's more comfortable and you have the the dial for focusing, so there are a few features that make it a little more appealing. And for just about 20 bucks, that's not bad for getting started. Oh, definitely. The thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions out there? Anything else you want to know, Sherm? <laughs> for anybody there at the commission you've been watching? <laughs> See if anybody has anything else, last minute, urgent things you want to ask. Anything else you want to say, uh, Craig, before we do wrap up? No. Um, no, no, not really. I, I think that, Definitely uh, let us know if you're doing anything. Yeah, definitely, please. So. <laughs> One thing that I did neglect to mention about the Orasma app is that you can subscribe to people, you can follow them. So if you like something that someone is doing, you can follow them and that way your phone is automatically populated with all of their future activity. Yeah, that one was looks very, I, I'm actually what I was impressed with a, a lot, we've heard about some of these like, you know, Oculus Rift, it's, you know, and the, I think the PlayStation one and the Google Cardboard, of course, the things you've heard about because they get the most uh, promotion or they're, you know, uh, most PR out there, but I was very surprised there's so many other options, other things to look into, and like that Erasmus one, that was pretty nice, so easy yeah, it seems to use. And it's really great. Oh, sorry. It's so easy, it seems to, I mean. It definitely is, yeah. You put it it's just great that so many libraries have started using it, and there's such a a massive amount of content out there from libraries already mm -hmm. using Erasmus. So that to me made it jump out a little bit more in terms of apps. Like I said, with um, related to QR codes, it seems easier than tr creating a QR code. Yeah, it's very easy. You basically just use your phone to take a picture and on the Orasma, you know, website, you can use drawing tools to select one portion of that image and then just use that as a trigger. Mm -hmm. As you saw with um, the Google Cardboard viewer that I used to trigger uh, reaction, it doesn't necessarily have to be a perfectly flat image, although it, it's, you know, it takes a little more uh, tweaking probably to get your trigger to come up sometimes. Mm. But yeah, it's, it's very easy. Yeah. Definitely a lot to start exploring and experimenting and playing with. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. See what works. All right. Well, it doesn't look like anybody has any urgent questions that they're desperately putting in. Just saying some thanks. And um, some of our commission people are watching are going to come by and bug you for some demos, it looks like. <laughs> and then uh, got there. <laughs> We'll see. All right. Okay. Well, then, uh, thank you, Craig. I'm going to, once I get myself situated here. Yeah. Okay. Pull back control to my screen. There we go. That should be coming up. And actually, we do this. Here, do that. There we go. Um, yeah, this is the delicious account I was telling you about. I've been collecting all the different links to as many of the ones I could catch. <laughs> um, uh, I'll probably go back and listen again or check out the slides to see. Um, so all of the different um, services and equipment and things and that um, Craig has mentioned will be on here. Um, so um, this will be included in the recording afterwards. Um, Craig's slides will be included as well. Um, I don't know if, where you you can get those to me at some point, Craig, or put them on your your where I can grab them for putting the recording up later. Uh, mm -hmm. That should be I should be able to get that up even um, later this afternoon for everyone as long as everything goes smoothly. So thank you everyone for attending today. Um, over here on our Encompass Live website, you can see our archives will be right here. These are our upcoming shows, but our archive sessions are right underneath here. Um, here's last week's show where we had, uh, we had recording up, we had links, and then we had some documents here. Same kind of thing will be available to you um, for today's show to watch. So, come on, we're going back. There we go. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, I hope you join us next week when our topic is uh, bed bugs. Ah, yeah, bed bugs in the library. Um, that's not cool. Uh, we will have some people um, joining us from our Lincoln City Libraries. And I don't know from looking at it, I'm not sure if they actually had this experience themselves or they're just letting people know hey this can happen because it has happened at mary libraries so and we also have someone um jody green who's from our lancaster county extension office to talk about the life cycle of these bed bugs and things that can get into that people can bring into your library either when they come in or when they return items to you that the bed bugs may be in there so if you're concerned about that you can definitely um uh sign up for our show next week and any of our other shows we have coming up on the schedule. Um, we are also, and it's not coming up on here. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Thank you very much for attending and we hope we'll see you next time or in our future shows on Encompass Live. Thanks. Bye-bye.